Good morning, everyone. We hear you all really enjoyed the Q&A section of the episode. We still have some questions that people sent in that didn't quite make the cut, but we'll be sure to sprinkle them throughout the rest of the month. People really appreciated the debate around Ukraine. Look, once again, glad we get out of the place where we can disagree about things, but still show up the next day. So here's what we wanted to do. We talked about Ukraine. We had an episode about the Civil War. All that was super depressing shit. Don't really curse much, but I think that's the only way to put it. So here's what we wanted to do. We wanted to have an episode as we're nearing the end of the first month of the year that was positive, that spoke to what we are trying to accomplish here on The Realign, which is really building a space where we can think out loud and try to find a way to make this country and the world a little better and make these make a little more sense. So we brought back Frank Stefano, fan favorite. We've done two great episodes of Frank. He's written a book called The Next Realignment. It actually came out a little bit before the Realignment podcast launched in 2019. I did a great episode with him in late April. It really focused on the idea of realignments. What are they? How do they really happen? If you really want to listen to an episode which explains this show, it's this one. Then he came on with Sagar and I after Sagar launched Breaking Points. We kind of talked about contemporary politics, but this show is focused on the future. Sagar, what did you like about it? I love Frank, man. That guy and I are almost like mind melded in the way that we think about politics. He's got such a good read on history. He's looking and observing the same kind of deep trends uh, that I am and that you are. And he is going to help you, if you're listening to this, just think about stuff. Think about politics in the small P, not the capital P, which is how I would ideally, if you could take one thing away, is to try and observe meta trends and see how they influence all of our lives and our outlooks and how we feel about things and how that manifests ultimately in politics rather than the day-to-day uh, absolute crap. So that's what I love the most about this. Frank helps me think, and he's a good, great, good guy to bounce ideas off of. Yeah, and quick thing. A, Frank has a great YouTube channel where he puts on these like 10 minute videos explaining realignment ideas. He just did an interview with Andrew Yang. So if you like this one, if you like Andrew, go check that out. And finally, the real compliment to Frank is he is the first guest we've ever had where we asked him what he thinks America should look like. And then he pauses and says, well, I guess that's just my opinion. I'm trying to find a vision that could actually yeah. work for yeah. everybody. And just that was just that was that was like a real like self-aware so moment that you just do not see from people. So that's something I'll be able to take away. Okay, quick shout outs. It's Thursday, Substack's coming out. So send us a subscription. It's located there. Send us a tip. Also check out our bookshop. Lots of great stuff. Lincoln Network. Thank you. Let's get into the episode. Frank Stefano, welcome back to the realignment for your third appearance. Thank you very much uh, for having me back on. Hey, anytime, man. It's great to have you. It's funny. For new listeners, Frank has appeared on the podcast twice before, one for a solo interview where we really focused on explaining the thesis of his book, The Next Realignment, which obviously really tracks with this show. The book came out a few months before we actually launched the show back in 2019. And the second one was more of a discourse on politics. And this third one is more of just a temperature check. It's uh, good to start off, we're a little past the start of the new year, but start off the first month of the year with a bit of a discussion on the wide vagaries of American politics. So let's just start with a tweet you put out a little bit ago, December 31st. To all those saying 2022 is going to be even worse than the last two, you're wrong. 2022 is the year that we start to turn this thing around. Mark my words, America is sick of wallowing. It's time we start going back up. Now, I love hearing that. Um, I should note we started this season with an episode predicting a coming civil war. Sagar obviously really disagreed with that. I kind of disagreed with it. We'll get into this a bit here, but why the optimism? Let's just let's just help course correct us a bit. All right. The reason I'm optimistic in large part is the way people are starting to react to when I talk about this stuff, right? Like until I think the last election, there was this sense that, um, that there was a, that we were in an odd period, but that at the end of the Trump presidency, everything would go back to normal. Okay. And everybody thought that this was just this weird anomaly, but everything underneath the system was fine. And then what changed in the last really six months is people started waking up to the sense that, no, this is a big structural problem. There's something bigger going on. And, uh, and it's something that we need to do something about. And that's the, 
thing that I've been waiting for, because when people have kind of woken up to this idea that, no, the system as it exists, the frameworks aren't working, we're not solving problems, things aren't getting done, and they don't trust that the system will just sort of write itself on its own, that's when people start wanting to do things. And, you know, and I'm starting to see people kind of reach out to me and, you know, people are networking about this. I really have a sense that there is this energy underground that a lot of people don't see yet of people changing their own perspective and starting to do the work. And, and that's why I'm very optimistic that while this is all happening underneath the surface right now, that it will, you know, it's going to take some time. People need to organize. They need to get to know each other. They have to, we have to build a whole new set of ideas. This is a ton of work, but that people are willing and able and ready to do that work. And so that's why I, I'm positive. Now that doesn't mean that things can't get worse before they get better, but they, cause they can, but I, I do think that that change of perspective is, is, the first step that I've been waiting to see to doing what needs to be done. So that's that's why I'm optimistic. Yeah, it's a really interesting point. Uh, it's funny because we're talking on the day I just did a monologue on why I think The Rock should run, um, specifically based upon uh, a poll, which I love, which is that the number of Americans who want both Biden and Trump to run again is equal, approximately 27%. Huh. Um, over 70% of the public on both do not want both to run. Now, I mean, those are the two most likely nominees mm -hmm. for president of the United States. I can't think of a better emblem for how the system is broken. And so I think that kind of goes towards the leading edge of what you're talking about. But talk more about the kind of enlightening of the people who think that the traditional solution of a Joe Biden or a, within the existing political architecture Talk more about why that fell apart. What were the big structural reasons as to why it was inevitable to fail? Yeah. Well, I think there was a lot of people who were hopeful. Maybe they didn't believe it was true, but they were hopeful that, all right, so there was going to be this Biden presidency and Biden was going to come in. He was going to appoint Mitt Romney as secretary of state. Uh, Bill Kristol was going to come work in the White House. Right. And um, and all of these this new coalition of people were going to come together. All these young people were going to come in and start being innovative and having these new ideas. And I think when people went to the polls last time, there was a large number of people who had that scenario in their mind, whether or not there was evidence that that was what was going to happen. And then what happened was essentially, you know, the, a traditional Democratic presidency came in and, you know, it was staffed by the same people that have staffed Democratic presidencies, you know, for the 20th century. And they didn't really seem to have any ideas beyond the ideas that we've had before. And, you know, that's not to be, nobody should be surprised about that, but I think that's what woke people up. And I think this Build Back Better bill is actually a great example because like, you know, you listen to people talk about it. And you know, I don't think most normal Americans know what's in it, right? No. They, they don't really, and there's nothing in it that sort of catches your eye and you're like, yeah, oh man, that's care. innovative, right. right? That's something that's new. It's, it's sort of like, let's just do more of what we've been doing. And, and so people are getting frustrated again because they keep going back and forth, looking for somebody to, prevent, to present something new, to, to say, okay, we have all these new problems. Here's a new idea that we've never heard before. Maybe not just like, let's fund a program, let's, let's change some laws, let's change uh, some, you know, th th these approaches to the way that we solve things. Let's look at things in a new way and let's not try to satisfy, you know, all the traditional constituencies. Let's see if we can satisfy a slightly different group of constituencies. So, so this is interesting, especially because you just did a long form interview with Andrew Yang on your YouTube channel. We'll link to it in the show notes. Of course, I want to understand, it's not a contradiction in what you're saying, but I want to understand what your diagnosis of the problem is. You say, um, and you say this in the book specifically, 
the problem in our political system is that outmoded 20th century parties and ideas are consistently failing to meet the challenges of the 21st. And as that continues to swing back and forth, you're going to just continue to see this issue with the two-party system. If you read into Andrew's work, though, and the scholars who support his work, the argument he makes is a little less centered on the ideas side of things Mm -hmm. and is more centered on, no, the problem is specific structures of our government. So the way we elect representatives in Congress, the way that the actual representatives behave structurally when they get there. So help us understand the delineation between these two Uh seemingly contradictory ideas, because I personally, at least from completing your book, actually, which I actually did um, after winter break, instead of making it three fourths of the way through, Mm -hmm. I don't think the issue is as much the literal structure of the democracy. I think Uh it's more on the ideas end. So where do you come out as you think about? Yeah, no, I I agree with you. And that was that was what I was trying to bring out in that interview with Andrew. And I, I, you know, we did some. That, you know, one of the things I didn't want to do in that interview was just talk about um, all of the, the sort of reforms to democracy, which I know has been the center of his movement because and, and to sort of start pushing him on well, what are the ideas that this new forward party is going to represent? And um, because I agree. So my take on, on these structural things that everyone's looking for as a golden or a silver bullet is that it, some of them could probably help. OK. And the big one that I've been thinking about new that I hadn't thought about before is this whole problem of party primaries, because it is a new thing in American government, party primaries, right? Until the 60s and 70s, it was still uh, brokered conventions and and bosses. This idea that we select candidates purely by primaries, and there are some problems that primaries create. And so there are probably some reforms that we could do to make parties more fluid. But it's not going it, to, this idea that we're going to eliminate what we think are as blockers and that new ideas are just going to sprout up, that I don't buy. And I think you actually have to do the work. You have to assemble these new ideas. You have to build coalitions of people. You have to you know, really think through things new. And it doesn't happen on its own. You can't just sit back and say, well, if we change the structures, these things will just bubble up because I, that I, I, I disagree with. And so all the people who have structural solutions to this, I think, are being a little bit um, too. Technocratic, uh, if you will. Yeah, exactly. We change and, and, the, the knobs and the dials and then that equals everyone's happy. Right. You know, it's, it's funny. It's easier. It's funny. Okay, I'm sorry. watching, Frank, some progressive leftists come to term with this. Uh-huh. Um, especially, you know, my partnership with Crystal, she's always kind of understood it, but kind of her cohort, because they're like, oh, wait, even if we change the filibuster rule, we're not going to get any of what we want. And I was like, uh-huh. yeah, you know, I've been trying to tell you that for a long time. You know, it right. turns out that, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, elected representatives or, the, or, or the fact that gerrymandering this year actually came out in the Democrats favor. You don't hear a peep about that one. Once right. again, we, our problem is not gerrymandering. Would fixing it fi- uh, a little bit? Yeah, like a little bit. Uh, would that change like the broad institutional lack of a lack of institutional faith in America? No. <laughs> Same no. thing. Yeah, I mean, you could even you could nuke the electoral college, and that actually would probably have the opposite effect. So this is what I want to get at with you. What do these new ideas look like? Um, right. What does a new consensus? actually mean um for creating new coalitions for governing just just lay that on us all right well let's start with you know i'm always very you know i certainly have my views and we'll talk about my views one of the things i'm always very wary of is that everybody you don't want the solution to be here's my solution to fix america by itself because ultimately The goal is you have to sustain a coalition, right? You have to have new ideas that fix the problems that people care about that not only I'll buy into, but that 50% of America will buy into. And I know that that's some stuff that I'm going to like and some stuff that I'm not going to like, and and I'm prepared for that. So that, you know, that's, I just will put that to the side. 
But, I, you know, the first problem, I think, is, you know, the information economy and the global economy has changed the way people work. Mm-hmm. I think this is the one of the biggest things that we're not really dealing with in that I've been fascinated. Have you been following that? I mean, I'm sure you have this whole anti-work. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. I have a big following there, actually. Yeah, it's fascinating. Show. Right. And, 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 and they have a lot I of. I haven't followed this as much. Could you explain what this is? Sure. Um, it's centered around a community on Reddit, but it's kind of taken off as a movement. And it's been written about a lot of places. But it's basically people who feel like um, that the economy, if I have to distill it down, is that they're being taken advantage of as suckers at work and they don't want to put up with it anymore. And that they feel like the employment relationship um, for most corporations and for most people in America, uh, there's this idea that you're being asked to give loyalty, but loyalty isn't returned, that um, you're being treated like a cog in a system, a replaceable cog, and people are trying to fight back and rebel. Sagar, would you say that's probably, that's about right, right? Yeah, very, very correct. Yes. So, you know. Okay, so why do they feel that way? Well, a large part it has some of it has to do with with globalization, so, you know, and all this sort of much more efficiency. Some of it has to do with, you know, stuff that historically I was this whole idea of uh, shareholder value, the the cult of shareholder value, which which I for a long time bought into, is that the the only there was the only stakeholder that management should care about is shareholders, and that everything would work itself out. And um, which is very different from the old Yankee aristocracy, which had this view that that, uh, you know, you'd work for 30, ide- 30 years and get your gold watch and you would be taken care of. So there's all these changes with that. All right. So what are we going to do about that? OK, okay because the reason that, that fascinates me is so many people, their only relationship with the country, with America, is their job. Yes. Their relationship with their employer is their relationship with America. If they don't trust their relationship- Wait, with, well, that was a big assertion. Can you explain that? Well, most of our life is spent at work. Most of the authority that we have to sort of be responsible to is our manager. I think for a lot of people in this country, and I also think that a lot of people, one thing that's different from a lot of Washington people or entrepreneurs or whatever, there are a lot of people whose view of the world, and there's nothing wrong with this, is right. they want to work hard they want to plug themselves into the system and they want to do something that has meaning and that pays back to them, right? They don't want to start a company. They want to sign up. They want to have a skill and then want to be valued. Okay. And if they can't do that, then the society isn't working. And if they feel like, like they're not taking, if they're being taken advantage of at work and, and they don't like the relationship with their manager and they feel like, it's not just their re- employment relationship isn't working. They feel like America isn't working. Yes. And, and, and so there is a responsibility. Well, I, it, it, it's, you can call it a duty or responsibility, but you can also just say in self-interest that if you want people to feel like America's working and that they buy in and trust their institutions, they have to feel like they're respected in their job and that they're getting what they want, which is, you know, it doesn't mean that, that they think that, they're just going to be, uh, you know, everyone's going to be a millionaire or whatever. It's just that they feel like they're not being taken advantage of and that they're being respected. Okay. And people used to have more of that than they do now. And this is just, this is just sort of, and let me say, this is just one thing that I'm throwing out there as, as there's a huge movement happening about this. People are discontent and I don't hear any politicians really talking about it. You know, it's, it's fascinating, Frank. Some of the top performing segments that we do on Breaking Points is about exactly what you're yeah. pointing to. And I just want to add even more data for people who are listening, which is that we have this great resignation phenomenon, which is almost entirely blue collar, has not touched the white collar workforce, which is part of the reason why it's not talked about by politicians mm-hmm. and in the media. But the second part is this, and this even more reinforces your point. The great resignation happened at the exact time that union membership fell to an all-time low. So Hmm. people are not looking to the previous established institution of the union in order to collectively bargain for better working conditions. Mm -hmm. They are taking it incumbent upon themselves to say, I'm going to move and go do something else. But what's worse is that there's no cross-political movement 
which is talking about any of this. This is why I've called like 2022. This was kind of a breaking points branding thing, but I was like, hey, I want 2022 to like be the year of the worker. Kind of right. because it is, you know, it, it it really is in terms of macroeconomic political conditions. So can you expand on why is union membership at an all-time low at the time of the greatest labor uprising since what, 1948? Something like that? I mean, it's stunning, right? Well, I, you know, and this is the whole, like anything. So the union is a 20th century yeah. idea, right? I mean, it, it, it's designed around factories. And, and the working conditions of factories, and it's been adapted. But you know, whenever it's been adapted outside of the factory world, I don't think it's really you know white collar unions are sort of they're, they're weird animals, right? And right. It, the, the whole idea of public sector unions and, and whatever, um, you know, promoting people by seniority, having all kinds of work rules, you know, all of that. It was very it was a solution to a specific set of problems, and those were the problems of you know, an early industrialization factory world where you had things like the Triangle Shirtwaist disaster, right? And I don't know if you guys, it, it was a big event in history that led all this where- The um, fire, it, yeah. Yeah, it was a big yeah. fire. You yeah. know, you had all these mostly immigrant women. It was a sweatshop. There was yeah. a fire. The doors were locked to keep them working um, so nobody could take a break. And and a bunch of people burned to death and it, it led to a lot of reforms. So- you know, the union is, is a response to, to that kind of world. So I don't think people are looking back to, you know, if you're working in most jobs, you know, if you're in an auto factory, then still, you know, there's people looking to unions, but in a lot of jobs, they're looking for something else. But I also think there's another thing. And, and this is, again, just, you know, this is even beyond realignment stuff. This is just my thinking about this, which is, I do think that the last few years have really driven home to me how much of politics and and society is about dignity ultimately, mm. and that um, when people get it, it, people don't just get upset because of money or power. The thing that they really push back against is when they feel like they've been robbed of their dignity. And you know when, like like a very small thing when we're talking about this anti work thing that I find fascinating is how much of it is about people applying for jobs and not getting a call back to, told that, to get told they didn't get the job, right? This is such a minor little thing. It's something Washington doesn't even think about. But people really, really hate it. It makes people feel terrible. And it causes people to be, or, or the idea that, you know, when there's a mass layoff and you didn't do anything wrong and they call everybody into a conference room and then you get frog marched out of the building by security with all your things in a box, okay. There are things like this that really impact people's sense of self-worth and dignity. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that's often what people hate more than the fact that they're, I mean, they'd like to make more money an hour or two, but a lot of that I think really matters. And you know, when you look at this, I, I, that's, that's a lot of the Trump movement I feel like was about dignity. I feel oh. like a lot of the, the stuff that you hear from, from, uh, from young people who are upset is about dignity. I think restoring a sense that everybody is valued uh, and that that the system is fair, that everything works the way that they're supposed to work, that their leaders are looking out for their interests, not just their, not just their own, the leader's own interests, but for the people they're supposed to take care of. When that's lost is when people get upset. And this is where I want to give you a huge compliment because you did the thing you said you needed to do, which is that you separated your individual policy preferences yeah. from the analysis of the situation because right. and you picked the perfect issue to do it with because you're getting at where Andrew's well-intentioned model doesn't get you there enough. So for example, if you talk to a lot of the people, Catherine Gale had her on the realignment, we really mm -hmm. like a lot of these people who talk about electoral and structural reform fixing problems, they basically would say something along the lines of, we elect all these extremists and the extremists aren't willing to fix things. If we had more moderates, we effectively would solve these problems. But in the category you're describing, this category of workers and dignity and union representation, Sagar, you're no fan of him, so this won't be a shocker, but Dan Crenshaw is pretty moderate. Um, as a Republican in the Trump era, a fact that we can be, yet let's ask his position on worker representation issues. Let's ask his position on most of the things you're actually talking about. Now, I'm not 
attacking those positions. It's complicated. People hold different views. But moderation, extremism, you even made this good tweet, which I was going to reference a little later, Frank, that we should probably even retire the words centrist mm-hmm. and moderate because they don't tell you anything. Dan Crenshaw is a moderate, but that doesn't mean he's going to sit down with you or sit down with Sager and say, OK, hey, time to address worker power in some capacity because that doesn't really track there properly. So here's the actual question. The actual question here is, if we're focused then a little further away from the structure part towards the idea part, why hasn't UBI mm-hmm. actually caught on? Andrew Yang, before he lost the mayoral race, and I think lost a lot of political capital, to be honest. But before then, when if you if you if you actually talk to politicians on background saga, you and I have done this, they would tell you things like, Yeah, like we were interested in Andrew's movement. We think that he is doing something. I think he's actually driving the trend of people wearing ties less. I actually think that's him. I think there's something about his goofiness that people picked up on. But I have not seen a single politician outside of a couple local people like the former Mayor Tubbs of Stockton, California, say UBI. That is the thing. Right. That is the way I get popular. So why isn't UBI the idea to your framework that addresses the structural concern you're talking about? Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is – and this is one of the big problems when you start talking about doing something new too, right? All right, because there's two versions of that. There's there's the one version, which is the grab bag of popular policy version of that, which is what most people jump to. I got a plan for that sort of politics where, <laughs> OK, we're going to find every constituency and we're going to mm-hmm. give everybody uh, a plan of how we're going to fix their individual problem with no greater message or agenda or whole or strategy or ideology about what that means. And that, and I feel like the, the reason UBI isn't caught on is because it's just one grab bag, random idea. And it seems so different from anything we've ever done that people look at it. One, they don't believe it's ever going to happen. And it doesn't seem to be packaged into any greater idea. I think that what's, what's important when you start thinking about, okay, let's deal with things in a new way is thinking also, okay, Like, let's take, okay, let's figure out 15 different policy ideas. Like, one thought that I've had is, all right, you'd go to each of the different experts who really, you know, not the political experts, like people who actually know a lot about all these new problems and think, okay, thinking blue sky from scratch, what would you do? Okay. You figure out, all right, well, this would help here. This would help here. This would help here. This would help here. And then you figure out how do we package that into a message into a greater whole, because that's what people believe in. Nobody, one, except for people like us, most people don't pay attention to the white papers and all the policy ideas in the first place. And I don't think they believe in them or trust them anyway. Even if they did read them, they'd think, well, that's never really going to happen. But they do believe the idea that like, I have a sense of what's broken and I have a greater mission on how to fix it. And you think this is like FDR. It's not that the grab bag of New Deal policies that people responded to. It's this idea that FDR had a strategy for dealing with the policies as a whole that they bought into. And if you can't somehow take all these different things and package them into a whole, into an ideology, into a message that can appeal to half the country, I don't think you're going to start seeing buy-in on an issue-by-issue basis. It's just not how I sense that people work and how their relationship with the government. And this is the problem with all kinds of polling, right? I mean, how many times have we seen this in polling where somebody goes and says, um, well, look at all these different issues and people polled that we, we polled popular on all these different issues. And then how come they're not voting for us? Because people don't respond on an issue to issue basis. They, they, they want to, you know, you think of like the Democrats in the 20th century, the Republicans. You elected a Democrat or Republican, and you kind of knew what their approach was. You knew what their philosophy was, and you got a sense of the kind of thing that they would do without people pulling up a pamphlet and looking issue by issue and being, oh, I agree with this one. I disagree with this one. And that's what's missing is getting all these people together and somehow packaging this into a whole. Or the other thing we were talking about when we were talking about Buckley, that's the other side of it. Like FDR, the other one's Buckley, who took all of these people, all the people who were anti-New Deal, 
And the libertarians, the religious conservatives, the, the sort of the free market people, and they all hated each other and they had different priorities and he packaged them together into conservatism. And it's only once he packaged all these people together from different movements into one united movement with a conservative united approach that people started to really buy into it. And before then, you know, the Republicans were basket case. Man, so two things here that are very, very, very important. Why is ideology important? Because we're doing a lot of subtweeting this episode, but I think it's important to continue to subtweet because a lot of people who find this show, who are attracted to the forward party, they don't like ideology. They actually see ideology is a problem. So if I'm sure there's a part of the audience that's a little surprised to hear what you're saying because right. it seems like they'd say like, actually, wait, like, isn't the problem, Frank, the labels? Isn't the problem conservatism? Isn't the problem progressivism? So why, separate from the specific critiques of how those ideologies play out, is ideology itself an important thing? Yeah, yeah. And 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 the the counter example is the early years of our founders trying to implement their ideas, right? I mean, we right. So our constitution was built on the idea that there wouldn't be parties, right? We always talk about how they hated parties and and that everybody, they thought all these rational, fair-minded people would come to Congress and reason issue by issue, and it didn't work. And we ended up with parties with ideologies. And it was because without them, you couldn't coordinate action, that you can't actually get things done in, in, in the government. And, and this is, and it's good without buy-in the House, the Senate, the White House, all the states. There are so many points that you need to coordinate if you want to actually implement agendas. And you have to get buy-in across the system. And so if you don't have, if every of these groups, if, if, if the House and the Senate, everybody's just like a bunch of cats wandering around, nothing gets done and everybody starts looking out for themselves and careerism and ambition. And that's again, when the first party system died, that's what happened. That was why the era of good feelings was a disaster because it, the system didn't work. You cannot coordinate, particularly in a federal system uh, with a big nation like this, unless you can get buy-in of half of the country. And so that's what an ideology does. An ideology is sort of a top line agreement of, okay, we're going to half the country to cooperate together on a common goal. And this is the common goal that we're going to achieve. And then on the other side, when you say, you know, all these reformers that look at like multi-party systems and, and this idea that, that this is going to lead to better. And I'm like, I don't know that Italy is better. I mean, really, I mean, if we get closer to Italy, uh, Italian politics for all of these yeah. specific reasons, because Wait, it's so fluid. Say, who, who asks, who wants that? Like <laughs> Right. And, and, you know, it's a multi-party system with very fluid parties. Um, and where, where people switch, I just saw a stat the other day saying that, um, about party switching in Italy. It was like ridiculous for the percentage. I can't remember offhand. It was something like half of the politicians in the last five to 10 years had switched parties just because it's so fluid there and, and it doesn't work as well. So the ideology is how you bind people into a common cause and give them a direction. And you know, one of the, the metaphor that I think about a lot is, um, for a lot of people, politics is like the menu, right? You go into the restaurant and you look at the menu and you get Republican ink and Democratic ink and you order off the menu. There's a small number of people that are making their own recipes and thinking about this stuff beyond that. And when what's on the menu isn't working, then people are upset and you need to add something new that they want to the menu. And then people can come in and order off the menu. And again, that's what ideology does. So this is my question then around what does the new ideology look like, which could be successful in politics? So you could take right. your personal views out and just right. look at where we are and be like, okay, if I just wanted to win, that's it. Right. What would I do? What would I do? I, you know, all right. So to me, I, I think 
something Teddy Roosevelt like is where the center point of this next system is going to be. And I'm always and I'm very fascinated by Teddy because he is he's pro. Uh, I mean, he you know it, he's he's a capitalist who believes in the economy and business, but he also believes that the system needs to work and serve everybody and do what it's supposed to do. And we've got to rid things of corruption. We have to reform things so that everybody gets a fair shake. And this is why I, again, I keep coming back to this American dream thing, right? So, and the reason I keep coming back to that is because I keep seeing it everywhere. This idea that people want, people's complaint is the system doesn't work the way it's supposed to work, that institutions aren't actually looking out for them. All right, so how do you, and I think that's true, because everything is outdated and breaking down. So, and then, and then elites who are in control of institutions that no longer have directions or agendas do what they're gonna do, which is look out for themselves and their own interests because there is no greater good, there is no mission to buy into anymore. And so it's just, people are kind of pushing and pulling in whatever direction and nothing's happening. I think you make that the center of it. You say, all right, we are going to, the first step is we're gonna make all of our institutions work the way they're supposed to work. Okay, what does that mean in practice? Well, it's a lot of stuff that's both left and right. The stuff we're talking about anti-work, let's make mm -hmm. sure that the economy works for everybody and everybody feels like they're, you know, like for example, scheduling. You know, that, that a lot of uh, people who work by the hour get their schedules changed at the last minute. Okay, this is something that Washington doesn't care about, but like, it's a problem. And of course people, you know, if I'm an employer, of course I'm gonna do it. I wanna be as flexible as I can, but, if you're a working person and you've got kids to take care of and then your manager five minutes before either cuts your hours and cuts your day or, or, or okay, there's a lot of stuff like that to just make the economy in their small ways, but they're actually big on people's lives to make it work better. You try to make, you know, the stuff about police reform. Quick, quick, I think quick, that, quick interruption, Frank, because yeah. you actually brought up something that's really helpful. Help me understand though how those small but impactful fixes lead to political reward. Because I think this is the one, not the one useful thing that yeah. reformers are bringing in, but they really focus in on this idea that politicians have to be rewarded or see clear rewards for taking specific action. So for example, you're talking about the scheduling thing. That's a good example. Another example is something that Lena Khan um, is working on right now, which is the making it so big companies with crazy subscription plans can't basically make it impossible for you to unsubscribe. This is your yeah. gym. This is the New York Times. All these different things that really, really, really add up. And this is a good policy. I support the policy. There's something for, the, Lena Khan even referenced the New York Times being a problem. Mm -hmm. So there's something for the right there too. But the Biden administration will get zero credit for this well, actually happening. So, so just help me. So just help well, me understand I, I how the reward you remember, part works. You guys remember, this is maybe, I don't remember. This might be too long ago. I don't remember. Do you guys remember Jim Gilmore and the car tax? Oh yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Right. I do. So yes. wait, wait, when is this? I just, uh, I'm curious. God, it was like, I can't early two thousands maybe. Yeah. It was the, I remember learning about this and yeah, 18 years later from 2015. So it was like in the 1990s, late maybe 90s. 90s. All yeah, right. I remember reading Jim, about it. When Jim Gilmore ran for governor of Virginia and he basically had one issue, which was abolishing this car tax. Okay. It was a minor issue in the big picture, but it was a big annoyance to everybody in Virginia. They had a, an excise tax on cars. So you had to register your car with the state and you had to pay a tax every year based on the value of your car. And it was this minor pain point that people loathed. People hated writing a check every year to just because they owned a car based on the value of the car. And he, and, and he, won, he won an election based on that issue. And you'd say, well, that's a small issue, but it directly answered a pain point people had. And made their lives better in a concrete way in, that they could see. They're like, okay, I hated this tax. You said you'd get rid of the tax. You did get rid of the tax. I don't got to pay it anymore and I'm happier. And he got the reward for it. I think politicians underestimate how much concrete small changes like that. You know, 
people Frank, appreciate while you're, what you're talking i just realized bill clinton his career was nuked on uh okay you can correct me if i'm wrong because this is like 1970s but i believe he increased the gas tax yeah yeah um, something like that his first year in op or the tag tax like the whatever it was, it was, for your it was, license it was, plate it was the tag it was not a lot it was like 35 cents he literally lost his <laughs> first bid for re-election the way it works in arkansas is a weird system you're up every two years i believe and this so was cha- this, this they, cha- they probably changed, changed this okay yeah. so this was again this is like 1978 when all this was happening um, but Clinton put, he basically had the gas tax back, um, brought it or increased it or whatever. And he got voted out of office and he spent two years ruminating and he spent, you know, toured the whole state. And the number one response is he raised my tag tax, raised my tax, raised my whatever tax. And he literally, his whole campaign, he's like, I won't do it again. I'll lower it. And he won. Yeah. Um, this is the interesting thing to me, which is which you're saying, if I was a national politician or maybe even a, a state politician, what you're referring to, I've talked about this on my show all the time. I have a huge uh, amount of people who appreciate what I do is I would ban what you're calling cloping, which is you have to close and you have to open. Um, yeah. Right. Th- people hate this because they have to yeah. stay at work until 10 to midnight, lock up the thing. You basically drive home. You're bleary eyed. You're so tired. And you have to wake up at 6 a.m. and you have to open. So you have to close and you have to open. Most white collar people have no idea what this is. This happens to tens of millions of people who yeah. work in retail. Ban it. Right. But then yeah. here comes a question. Is that ideological? Because then my inner, you know, I can already hear people be like, what are you going to tell people how to schedule? You know, who are you? Like, well, where does it end? What What if you're a small business and you have five employees? Then can you do clopening? Uh, I'm an entrepreneur, Frank. Like, I clopen every day. Are you telling me that I can't do that? Talk about that because that's going to be a big problem if yeah. we start doing well, these things. Yeah, well, so the... So this is, again, getting kind of in my own personal view, which is, all right, yep. so I've... Because I've moved a lot. So it, 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 for the first half of my political existence, I was pretty close to libertarian, right? Okay. I, I mean, and I am very free, and I am free market capitalist in my inclinations and in, in all of this. All right. But I do think that the mistake, and the reason libertarians have rightfully, I, you know, uh, people don't like libertarian ideology, a lot of people, is this idea that everything is about the only distinction that matters is private and public, right? Private, no laws, can't do anything public. All right, so that it's all about what the government can and can't do and not what is the government actually doing? Is it doing the things it is going to do well? Um, is, are the private things, you know, what should be, you know, what, what? because at the bottom line, this is Teddy Roosevelt again, mm-hmm. right? You can be pro-business and say level playing field, fair rules, so what you want in a free market economy, I think, is you want fair rules. You want a fair playing field, and then you let people play. It, it, you wouldn't want to have a football game where you know each team, you know, there was basically no rules and no officiating. That would be terrible. That's not going to lead you to excellence and the people doing their best. You need fair rules, and and so you can't object to. I think people like entrepreneurs and free market folks. One thing that they're going to need to do is stop being so dogmatic about and, and start thinking about, you know, you, you shouldn't be, uh, it, it's not, you know, it's not the government running all the companies to also say, let's make sure that the rules that we have that we're competing on are fair and treat people fair and that people like, and then you can let people free within those rules to compete and not be micromanaged and, and whatever. Mm-hmm. I think something like that, that, but see, that's a different way. We're not accustomed to thinking about things like that. I wasn't accustomed to thinking about things that way. Um, I think the same thing with social media, where, where, where people are, you know, were, are worried about the power of social media. And then you get the stupid debate about, well, they're private companies. They can do whatever they want. Or the government should totally regulate all speech on Internet platforms. And you're like, that's the wrong framework, right? The, the, the framework isn't just public, public, private. It's like, well, what are the rules that we want to compete on and that we want individuals who like, you know, social media, this is how, this is the public square now. So what are the rules going to be for access to and use of the public square? And that's a huge problem that nobody knows the answer to yet. And it has huge impacts on, on democracy. And you can't have that debate until you stop thinking 
Well, the answer is either the government's going to run the social media platforms or you, there's, there will be no rules because they're private. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And this is where your consensus framework is so important. I mean, this isn't literally your framework, right? Consensus existed before all of us were born, but just like the, the, the emphasis is important because the sad answer to your social media question is our society will not come to a consensus on that question in the next few years. And a key job as a politician is you have to get good at identifying what is an issue that we can actually forge a 50 plus one, and if you factor in the Senate, a actually implementable consensus on. And I think the way of squaring my skepticism on the Lena Khan subscription thing, and you're pointing out of Jim Gilmore with the need yeah. for a national narrative is basically as follows. So A, the problem of Lena Khan's thing isn't as you're saying that people don't care about small changes. It's that on the national political level, Joe Biden is not advancing a vision yeah. of the Democratic Party or of his administration as being one where every single bureaucrat in that administration wakes up every single day and thinks, how do we make life easier for everyday yeah. people? Like, and so, so if you just take the subscription thing by itself, if it's just some nice thing you're doing, it, it doesn't mean anything and there's no real narrative. But then, too, and this goes to the Jim Gilmore point, this is a this is an example of how state and local politics are different, because in a state and local politics situation, especially in a state like Virginia, which was going through a political realignment in the 1990s and 2000s, a big ideology is less important. And actually, if you are a if you're you know, I, I'm really suggesting if you're a Democrat looking at a state like Texas or Georgia when it comes to the governor's race, find those issues that aren't going to fall into the national political debate, which will make you look bad. So the, the covid lockdowns, yeah. mask rules, CRT and instead say, hey, like, isn't it screwed up? We have these really bad five things in our state specifically, and I'm going to fix them. So I think the, that's the that's I, the delineation I'm getting from what you're saying. Can I say the thing that I loved that you just said that I'm going to probably steal in some regard Take it. <laughs> is, is, is this idea that ultimately where you want to get is that people believe that the folks in government are waking up every day saying, how can I make life better mm -hmm. for ordinary people, right? What little pain, what pain points, what inefficiencies, what, you know, obstructions, what unfairnesses and injustices, how do I make life work better for people. I think if people believe that that is what the government is doing, they're going to like it. And if they think that they don't care about them or that, and that's the problem with like, all right, so like infrastructure. Okay. Obviously we have an infrastructure problem. I, I agree with that. Like, I mean, anytime you travel abroad and come back to the United States, the first thing that anybody says is, oh my God, right? Like you start looking at the highways, mm -hmm. you looked at the highways or wherever you were and the airport or wherever you Subways. were. And you come <laughs> yeah. And you're just like, wow, we have really let everything decay. All right. But if your answer is just, we're going to give you $5 billion for more infrastructure spending and people are going to go, eh, what does that mean? Right? I mean, it, it, you got to be like, we're going to build this bridge we're going to fix this highway. Then people are like, hey, you fixed that highway. I'm happy that you did that. Thank you. These are my people. And, and, and I don't know why we don't, you know, I, I think a lot of politicians just, they, they, they look at it like spreadsheet management. Mm -hmm. Look, we made the numbers go up on the spreadsheet. You should be happy. Yeah, it's funny, Frank. I kept talking about this during Build Back Better because they're yeah. like three and a half trillion. I'm like, of what? Like, what's in it? You know, because everyone was saying, oh, yeah. this is the return of deficit politics. And I was like, no, it's not that people are like, oh, my God, it's too much money. They're like, what Sorry, are you you've spending? You've never been about? a deficit hawk. So no, 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 that's no, the key. No, 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 I'm emphasizing saying. it, like, to be clear. But, but, yeah, but I'm not same, a deficit hawk. But, like, but, but I also think, yeah. like, when you say that, that I mean, I think yeah. that's right. Like, I look, I've looked into it. I barely know what's in the thing. Yeah, it's same. Like, it's my and job. It's it's <laughs> more of the same. That's why. Yeah. Why? OK, so you could just look at it. Why does nobody know what's in it? Because nobody was thinking in those terms and thinking of, well, what can we do? What can we do new? What can we, you know, what can we do to make things better in an innovative new way? And so what did they do? They took the stuff we were already doing and made the numbers go bigger. Mm -hmm. And it's just a very cheap, I mean, it's not a cheap financially. It's a cheap intellectual solution. It means I don't know what to do. I don't have an answer. So well, let's just keep doing what we're doing and do more of it. 
actually, we have the answer. And this is where your historical narrative writing is interesting and useful. The answer is you want to be, you want to, as a politician, be the new FDR. I think Biden was seduced by the new FDR takes because for the first time in his entire life, he is seen as this, and he was given this historical opportunity. So it's not just a fake narrative. He he has this historical opportunity. opportunity. And what is intoxicating, and I think a lot of the people who he really respects in the national media, who we actually frankly like, some of these people came on the show, did not serve him well. Evan Osnos, love Evan Osnos, Mm. love his books, come on the show. Him telling Biden, you have the FDR moment, ruined him. It's like with a child star. Telling a child star that their God on earth ruins them. Well, I think Biden, I like Biden. I voted for Biden. Admitted that I got for the first time here. It's pretty obvious, but you know, <laughs> let's just go there. Ruined. Just utterly ruined well, by that ambition. Let me not jump a, in okay. here, though. I thought about this. Yeah, sorry, sorry, want, yeah, sorry, yeah. Oh, I want sorry. Frank's reaction to what I'm going to say. Okay. I wish that he did learn the real lesson of FDR to me. And I talk about this constantly from Freedom of Fear. FDR never solved the Great Depression. You don't actually have to do it. You just have to appear like you care. That was mm-hmm. it. And you know, it's funny. I, I'm like looking at this, all this effort, freaking voting rights, bullshit, build back better, all this. I'm like, dude, put a hard hat on. Go to the port of Los Angeles. Why is this so difficult? Summon the Saudi king's ass over to Washington and say, I'm not gonna sell you a goddamn weapon until OPEC starts pumping gas. Every single one of you, you, all these benefits you get in the global financial system, dead. Uh, Get the Exxon CEO, get his ass in the White House tomorrow and be like, what are you doing about the price of gas? Meat. That's, I mean, again, this is basic stuff. Mm -hmm. And what's funny to me is that what they don't get is that that is the equivalent of the do something that Americans want. Look at every poll, 72%. Biden not focus on what I'm focused on. Biden not focus on what I'm focused on. High inflation. What they mean by that is I want the president to appear to care about the same thing that I care about. You don't even have to do it. You literally don't. You just have so to. It's better to if care. you do do it too. Yeah, it's better. But, these, but, like, these, but, but right to Sagar's point, these issues are. Yeah. The claim here is not that Biden could snap his fingers yeah. and fix Nobody inflation. Nobody thinks that. Right. Well, okay. But, uh, the, yeah. <laughs> the thing is, what you just said, Sagar, too, was very yes. much what I was about to say anyway, yeah. which was, <laughs> I, I, so I agree with you, and and yeah. With a mistake about what people meant about being the next FDR was not taking what FDR did in 1932 and the 1932 policies and doing mm-hmm. them again, mm-hmm. because it's not 1932. So being the next FDR in 2022 isn't going back and taking a 1932 specific agenda right. and doing that. It is doing, okay, what did FDR actually do? You're right. He had this massive problem, this loss of faith in the United States. The fact that Americans were starting to look abroad to Mussolini and to the communists because they lost faith in democracy because they thought the system wasn't working. And then he showed that he cared about their problems and came up with solutions for in and, and, and radical, innovative solutions that no one had tried before that yep. showed that he was doing everything in his power to fix those problems. That's what FDR stands for. Right. And, and 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 also throwing out all the orthodoxy. And a lot of what he did was Republican ideas. Right. Like he brought in the New Dealers included a lot of former Republican because the progressives, Teddy Roosevelt, they were progressives. The progressives were Republicans. He had some Democrats, some Republicans got the best minds he could and started trying to do concrete things. And a lot of his ideas were terrible and they didn't work. And then he threw them out and did different things. Mm-hmm. That's what FDR means. Right. FDR doesn't mean that specific policy. It's the same problem you see with Republicans when they say be Reagan and they take it to mean re-implement 1980 policies in 2022, which is not right. what, what it means to be Reagan either, because I doubt Reagan in 2022 would think the answer to the problems of 2022 were the specific things he did to solve the problems of that Because he was a talented politician. Yeah. He's the key Reagan thing. Reagan would <laughs> smile. He would look at Joe and he'd be like, oh, Joe. He tries his best. He goes, but we need a real leader in this country again. And that's what he would do. I mean, it would be beautiful. And honestly, it would be mourning in America again. You know, look, I'm not a huge fan of Ronald Reagan policy or whatever, but like it was all affect people. It was just, 
It was just well, all it's about caring about the problem. When you said, it, right. you know, the only place I disagree is that it yeah. doesn't matter if you do it, because I do think you ultimately ish. you have to do it. And, yeah. and, and I guess you can get pretty far by convincing people that you're doing it because they're not going to pay. You know, it I'll, takes so long. Frank, 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 this ask, is my me... 2022 take, which yeah. is that the rise of the Internet has actually yeah. made it so that dream politics is way more important than real think? politics. Yeah, I, I do believe that. Um, so Trump, hurts Trump, Trump, me. Trump firmly convinced me that you don't have to do a goddamn thing uh, as long as you appear as if you are. Uh, I Marshall, I, I, yeah, but I this is the, the, the problem wait, wait. of loss of legitimacy, because I do think the answer to I mean, loss of legitimacy is both people have to believe that you care about what they care about and that you're doing something concrete about it. And that's what you're saying. But I do think like if people's lives aren't working, if they feel like they hate their lives because there's all these things that are unfair and unjust and they're sub subjected to loss of dignity and, and all of this and they lose faith that's when the system falls apart. And that's what worries me. And that you have to actually do it. I think you have to actually make people's lives better. Otherwise, eventually they catch on that you're just all talk. But I think I you can so. win elections with talk, but I do think yeah. ultimately, and I'm thinking as parties too, because right. parties are, we're operating over decades. You know, you gotta earn people's faith, I do think, but. So two quick, uh, two quick things here, which is A, to just add to Sagar's point about not having to do anything, I think we're making this in a specific context of, in the specific context of, it's the fourth quarter. It's his first year. So obviously inflation cannot be as bad as it was in December 2021 as it would be in 2024. The point is, I think the American people are very forgiving in those first few years. FDR oh, yeah. was given a long, 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 like arguably until World War II, uh, really brought the labor market under control to fix it, quote unquote. Um, so the fourth quarter idea is important. So I, I want to finish with uh, two quick ideas here. If you don't mind, we'll probably go five minutes um, over the hour. Um, and then Sagar, put anything yours here. Sure. Um, so here's my first one. And then Sagar, you close us out. First one is... I came up with this idea when I did a breaking points monologue and I kind of started as a joke, but I'm increasingly convinced of it. I think that this whole idea of a politician needing to come in in their first hundred days and pass some big bill has destroyed three presidencies in a row. It, and it's complicated for Obama because I, I support Obamacare. I think it was the right thing to do. So maybe Obamacare was worth it. But at, at a minimum, coming in with this aggressive three-month plan and trying to be legislatively ambitious really like led to the 2010 midterms, which destroyed the domestic agenda of the presidency. Trump can't repeal Obamacare and ends up just passing a, a big tax cut, which as – we all know there are various arguments and various different sides for. And then finally, Biden comes and tries to do all these big moves and they can't happen. I think the better path for a politician moving forward in a world where you don't have majorities, in a world where everything's bad faith, why do you even do anything? Like, I, I, like honestly, like I think the, the move that I would have had Biden do is like Sagar said, put on the hard hat and go to the port of L.A., Go to grocery stores and say this is bad and take lots of meetings with energy executives. I think if he did those things and didn't try to pass big bills, which he could never pass in the first place, he would be better off. So just what do you think about this idea that maybe this idea of doing something in this 100 day we're using the FDR metaphor as possibly like a dangerous for a political perspective, dangerous mentality? Yeah, no, I I. If you don't have anything to do, this is the problem. When we're talking about if if you're passing something in the first hundred days because you feel like you have to pass something big in the first hundred days, then it's going to be garbage mm -hmm. because it's not it's not real, right? It, it it's big for the sake of being big to check the box, and I think that's a huge the, the hard hat thing too. You know, it's really it stuck with me too because I do think. If did you guys follow the, the 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 I think it was started on Twitter the guy the the executive yeah the Ryan Peterson. executive I know you're talking about Flexport. yeah Flexport okay. yeah right the Flexport what if Biden had gone down there I know and just watched himself and figured out like he brought ten people and and they watched what was going wrong and they said oh we need to change this rule and change and then you you would do stuff because it'd be easy and he man 
and then and then I, and then all I think of a sudden about this all the time frank it would have been so huge funny. i i say i'm like dude the flex pork guy got the regulation and you know like to your point about the first hundred days the whole thing was that we had some dire problems you know rural electricity or whatever uh in terms of the bank stabilization acts some of the stuff that passed it was like it was real i mean these were problems yeah. that millions of people had as a crisis in the everyday the current millions of people crisis is simple covid is making everybody miserable and shit yep. is too expensive get particularly gas yep just do that and you know i was pointing to this i'm curious for your reaction if i was biden i would have done some crazy shit i would have mobilized the national guard and i would have declared military uh installations out west and here norfolk and i would have been like every commercial port if you're waiting you come here you know, National Guard, you could uh, fi you could fix a trucking thing. You, you know how many trucks we have sitting on a military base? This is simple. You know, you're like, get the trucks out. Okay, if the Supreme Court strikes it down like they did with FDR, so be it. At least you tried. You know, right. it's the these are the types of things where people will forgive the hell out of you. Uh, same on the grocery store. You know, the whole empty shelves, Biden thing. Look, it's not Joe Biden's fault that there was a snowstorm. But once again, we have a freaking National Guard for a reason. Like, these, we have tools and elements of the state which are not being used creatively to solve the problems of today, which is fundamentally the legacy of FDR to me, which is why I hold him in such high esteem. People are always like, oh, FDR, LBJ. I'm like, the reason I respect these people was because they used existing institutions and tried to mend them towards the problems of today with yep. deeply creative thinking instead of yep. looking to somebody from 25 years ago and being like, oh, well, he did it. So, you know, it'll work around this time. Yeah, and, and when you, the thing about it too is so many of these things, like we were talking about with the ports. Okay, the problem, that, well, one of the big fixes was minor rule changes, yeah, right? Right. They, <laughs> right? It wasn't, and we're, this is again the car tax idea, right? Yeah. Okay, and why weren't those things getting fixed? Because inertia, because it wasn't, it was, nobody was, you didn't have political capital behind doing it. They'd been that way for a long time. There was inertia. Nobody wanted to move. Nobody wanted to change. Okay. And that's the kind of stuff that's infuriating because this is fixable. And, and it, it, the, the solution to so many problems is rule changes, just changing the way institutions work, mm -hmm. changing what the requirements are, getting something to move through the system and, um, and just making things actually work and making institutions and their leaders do what they're supposed to do, all of this. And that's the kind of thing that, Man, if the president was the champion of that, people would buy in, I think. And here's the last big question here. So I referenced the season opener with Stephen March where we were debating whether we're on the path to civil war. Obviously didn't agree with that. But towards the last part of the show, we actually got to a really productive conversation, which was basically about at a core level, something the three of us could agree on is the idea that it's a problem from a national cohesiveness perspective that America does not have some form of shared narrative mm -hmm. that it could ever, we could buy into, right? So like, so the, the interesting part of the like breaking apart the country debate isn't like, do Oath Keepers start a civil war? The interesting point is, well, actually like, why did the UK like have Brexit? Why did Scotland almost leave? It's because the UK lacks a post-World War II narrative or, or at least that post-war II narrative is under threat. So in our country, like, why is it that people feel hyper-partisanship? Why do they feel cut off? It's because it is increasingly clear that, and COVID really is a huge problem aside from just the death, because COVID perfectly hits at the heart of this. It doesn't seem like there is a national story that unites Ron DeSantis's vision of America with Gavin Newsom's vision of America. So, and once again, if, if we think of a, a narrative as just the foundation, so a narrative doesn't determine policies, right? So like you could say Dwight Eisenhower and Harry Truman, they ran against each other, but they both would say America is the land of opportunity and it's the American dream. They would both agree with that 1950s vision, whether or not it was actually true or not. So it seems to me that we all agreed there is a lack of cohesive narrative. Just let's, let's start this. Let's start this off here. We'll obviously have you on again at some point in the future so we could finish it. But what do you think a 21st century 
Florida, California, Texas, New York, let's throw South Dakota in there. What could be a narrative that could pull those, um, those really, those edges together and at least lead for, lead to the foundation necessary to build consensus? Yeah. You know, I've thought about this a lot too, because the core, the core thing you need to have people buy into this is this idea that there is something about America, and this is for every country, that is fundamentally good, that is noble, that we believe in, that we all want to be part of, right? That, 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 because if you want to be cohesive, you all want to be part of the same national community. And you want to be say, part of this national community because there's something about that community that's good, that's noble, that's special. All right. And this is all this stuff about Great Awakenings and whatever, this idea that, you know, for the last 50 years, on the left and the right in different ways, where there's been a lot of tearing institutions and the myths of America down because we wanted people wanted to make them better. So people have been looking at the things that they didn't like, that they didn't work, and they thought that there was an infinite reservoir of stability, that they could just keep tearing things down and tearing things down because once we ripped everything down, utopia would sprout up from, from but, but we couldn't get to utopia. We couldn't get to better unless we ripped down the things that were bad. And in some places they were correct about that. I think in some places there was a lot of stuff that we've ripped down in the last 50 years um, on the left and on the right. But at the same time, at some point you have to get back to, Hey, you got to rebuild this idea that here's what's good. Here's what is good about America. Here's what we're doing right. And this is the thing everybody wants to be a part of. And, and, and that's this, and the idea that enlightenment, liberal democracy is a good thing, that America has a duty to be the city on the hill and the, all of that that we've seen as hokey and has ripped it at was a key part of the national identity. And that if we have, this is this whole problem about elites that want to LARP as revolutionaries that we've mm-hmm. had where, mm-hmm. I, and this is across the set, we, we, we've this, we have all of our elites right now that don't take responsibility of the fact that they're in charge. Like they, they, they don't, they don't want to take moral responsibility of I am a leader and I have a duty to lead. They'd like to, to, to LARP about like they're the revolutionary tearing the system down instead of the guy in charge of it. And, and that needs to stop. I think that, that we need all of our institutions and our leaders to start also saying, Hey, this is a fundamentally good country in these ways and, and that we can make it better, of course, but like America is something to believe in. We have a better future ahead than we have the past. It's not, we're not in decline. We, we have all these great people and great resources and we've, we still have problems, but we look at how many we've solved and we're going to solve our future ones. It's such a small thing, but you got to give people something to believe. And if people have something to believe, then they can be united around that belief. Really well said. Always enjoy talking to you, Frank. Uh, really appreciate you coming back. Actually, sorry, we'll we just had a quick, oh, quick sure. closing thought there because it just ev- evokes something actually very important, which is that um, as someone who spends most of his time, and we all do effectively, in center-left dominated media circles, what you just described there, Frank, is if you are a member of the Democratic Party, if you are a center-left person, if you program – television at cnn you do not understand or write for the new yorker right some people get this but a lot of people don't you don't understand that you are the one who has charge over american institutions right now Mm -hmm. and too many people grew up in the or had their vision of america frozen during the bush years where there are too many people in the categories i described where they do this like oh like you think America is exceptional or they, they, they just basically like do the, they, they do these sort of like, I'm trying to find the best way to put this in a non bad faith way, but, but they, they basically, it's like you really said, it, it, actually let's just sum it up for what you said, which is that they think there is an infinite supply of America's like roots, topsoil. I'm obviously not a farmer, so I'm going to scrub the metaphor, but like, they, like there's, they, they, they don't understand there's actually not enough nitrogen in the soil to build what they want to actually build 
um, it's erosion. Actually, this is more like erosion. Let's just totally yeah. switch to like water um, and like a, a creek. That, that when 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 you when you attack when when you refuse to like accept the idea of what America is and understand that you have stewardship, it leaves you really vulnerable. And I said this during the Stephen March episode, but the people who took who took Thomas Jefferson out of the New York City City Council chambers, I don't. They, they do not understand the consequences of what they are doing. They yeah. don't understand that. When they take down that shared image, that isn't going to lead to the police getting defunded, right? Which is what they, which I terrible policy, but it's what they want. It's it's actually going to lead to an America that very much is the opposite of what they just desire. So that wasn't perfectly eloquent, but it, it's just my my honest my honest direct reaction. So yeah, Sagar, actually close us out, yeah. please. Frank, thank for real. I mean, I always love talking to you. You see the world very much the same way uh, as me, so. I'm very, very glad that you could be here, help enlighten the audience. Uh, we'll put links to the book and the YouTube channel down there in the description. And keep it up, man. Seriously, we rely on you a lot. So thank you. Well, also, Frank, a lot. turn, turn, here. turn your, um, turn your YouTube videos into a podcast. People oh, have commented yeah. on it. People, yeah. people, people have actually said this in the comments. What yeah. you should just, you should literally, the audio is there already. I'm just giving you on the, on the uh, audio right, advice here. Just take the audio and turn it into a podcast. Like we could help you with that, honestly. Um, yeah. It's pretty straightforward. We should talk about that. That's yeah. Send me, just, send me an email. I already have guys who do this. I can easily do this. It'd be easy. Uh, we like, can figure it out. Yeah. yeah. Cause, cause like it would, it would do really well there. Seriously. Like this is a huge recommendation for the channel. Okay. The actual end of the episode. Thanks for tuning in. Everybody. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Thanks a lot guys. for having me.